What's up, everybody? I'm Chris Hampton, your host. No, I'm just kidding. It's me, it's Lana. I'm the office manager here at Power Company. I just wanted to pop in real quick and tell you about something special we're doing. Hopefully you've been enjoying these daily episodes of essays from Chris's book, The Hard Truth, Simple Ways to Become a Better Climber. Maybe you're even thinking you'd like to snag a copy of the book for yourself. Well, it's the perfect time to do so, because right now, through June 10th, in celebration of the one-year anniversary, when you purchase a copy of The Hard Truth, we will be sending you some extra freebies. And I don't know about you, but I love freebies. Okay, so in addition to a copy of the book and some stickers, you'll also get a commit journal, which is a little notebook that's easy to throw in your pack, jot down some quick notes or whatever, three postcards of illustrated charts from our good friend Brendan Leonard of Semi-Rad Media, and another one of Brendan's charts from the book, The Success Built from Failure's Pyramid, in the form of a refrigerator magnet. So you can slap it on your fridge or camp stove or back of a car, wherever. Oh yeah, and Chris is going to sign your book too, so that's pretty neat. So head on over to powercompanyclimbing.com, click on the hard truth button, or banner, whatever, and you'll get yourself a copy. The offer runs now through June 10th, or until we run out of the free stuff, so don't dilly-dally. And you can find that link in the show notes, too, on your handy-dandy pocket supercomputer, as Chris would say. Okay, now on with the show. Don't squash the banana. Commitment. In the spring of 2011, while queued up beneath a 13D called Ultra Perm, I witnessed the very definition of commitment. No, it wasn't someone skipping two bolts and risking a ground fall just to send. That would be stupid. Instead, it was an act so casual that it didn't catch the eye of any of the 16 other people waiting for their burn. My friend and now power company climbing coach, Nate Drolet, in line just in front of me, asked his belayer if she wanted half of his banana. Of course she did. Who wouldn't? Rather than peel it and break it off with his chalky, dirty fingers or dig in his pack for a knife, Nate, wait for it, snapped the banana in half. Clean break right through the middle, like a ninja. My first attempt at snapping a banana ended in, well, banana pudding. It wasn't even a very ripe banana. Problem was that I didn't commit. I didn't go for it. I backed off at the last second. You can't half-ass it when you're banana snapping, or you end up with unappetizing mush. No bueno. You can plan every move you make. You can train harder and longer than anyone else. You might be the first person at the crag every day. None of it matters if you don't commit. It's not uncommon to see climbers squash the banana on a difficult onsite or red point attempt, and it's easy to spot. The climber gets to the crux move, looks up, looks down, looks up again, sometimes shakes their head no, and they're off. If your partner says take in the middle of a red point attempt for no apparent reason, they might be a chronic banana squasher. It happens every day on tall boulder problems. These are the lapses in commitment that are readily apparent. This doesn't mean that they are easier to fix, just that you're more likely to get called out on them. It's the harder to spot lapses that are the most dangerous, and these generally follow a never-ending path paved with excuses. I don't have the time. If you've made this statement concerning training more than a handful of times in the last year, you are definitely squashing the banana. You and most other people. I'm sorry, but I have to call bullshit. More likely, the truth is that you can't bear the thought of missing out on time spent playing video games or watching YouTube to actually put in a little hard work. You've got a lot to get done this week? Better get to it. I'd rather work a 60-hour week and climb on the weekend than stretch that workout over seven days. Doing anything well will require sacrifice. If it comes so easy to you that you don't have to sacrifice anything, then there's a good chance you aren't trying anywhere near your potential. If you're one of those people who think that you really don't have time to do enough training to get strong, 
there are a few things to consider. Less time can mean more focused training. Throughout the majority of the year, my training time is only about eight hours a week, five to six hours in the gym, over two or three small sessions, and an hour spent hangboarding in the early morning before work twice a week. You could easily get by with less, and if you have a small home wall, things get even easier. Four to five hours a week is plenty to make small gains, if it's focused. Now that I have my own wall, six hours is about right for me. That means stop hanging out at the front desk or chatting the night away. Get it done. You're probably training too much anyway. Systematic work plus rest equals training. Without sufficient rest time, you're essentially moving backward. If you're in the gym five or six days a week for several hours each session, get a hobby. One that doesn't require working out. If your muscles never get a chance to recover, how do you suppose they'll ever get stronger? While you're sitting here reading this book, there is someone out there, busier than you, training hard. Get your priorities in order and make a schedule. If getting better at climbing is a priority, then schedule it as such. When you learn to schedule around training time, rather than trying to fit training time into a busy schedule, you'll find that you're less stressed, more fit, and have far fewer excuses. If you keep it up, you won't need those excuses anyway. A tool as small as a hangboard can go a long way. If you really can't schedule any training time, you're absolutely maxed out, then get up an hour earlier and do a quick hangboard workout a few times a week. Hang while watching movies or between work calls. Finger strength is one of the cornerstones of climbing hard, and when not used, will disappear pretty quickly. You have room in your house for a small wooden hangboard, so build one and put it in. Otherwise, you're squashing the banana. Committing the time to get outside, particularly if you're a good distance from climbing, can be a little tougher. Again, the solution is planning. My friend Yasmin and I, though we rarely climb together, start emailing plans on Monday for the following weekend. Changes and updates continue throughout the week, but by Thursday, I know where everyone I train is climbing for the weekend. Make plans. Make backup plans. Have a third option in case of Superstorm Sandy. Then, stick to it. I never even got to get on it. Your day didn't go exactly as planned. Let me guess. You had every intention of getting on your hardest route yet, but a whole host of issues teamed up against you and kept you from it. You didn't bring enough food or water and felt hungry or dehydrated. It got dark too fast. Your skin hurt. Somebody was projecting it and hanging all over, and you just couldn't wait. You forgot your good shoes at home. You didn't get to bed until too late the night before. You forgot your coffee that morning. Any other excuse you want to make? Add accountability. Tell your friends about your plan. Post it on Facebook. Mention it to your partners that day. Maybe then it won't be so easy to back out for ridiculous reasons. You'll have more people to answer to and possibly more reason to go for it. Stop giving yourself excuses. This requires some planning ahead, and if you take care of your skin, you can't use it as an excuse. Pack your good shoes the night before. Never leave home without your coffee. Good preparation will leave you nearly excuseless and will almost always leave you with a better chance to send. Make a list. For some people, checking off little boxes is a powerful reason to go do things. If it helps you, make a list complete with little empty boxes. Hang it on your refrigerator or on your bulletin board at work. So it's scary. Okay. I get butterflies in my stomach every time I step on stage and before most hard climbs. That isn't fear, it's anticipation. Once you step on the wall, let your training take over. The butterflies will disappear and soon there will be a great story to tell, whether you send or not. The only real failure is in never trying. I just couldn't get psyched. I'm not even going to legitimize this one with bullet points. If you need to seek outside your own self to find your motivation to rock climb, it's going to be a rough ride. Maybe your partners weren't that psyched. Maybe they were moving too slow for your liking. Doesn't matter. It's up to you to set your own pace and make your own plan. It's great to have a psyched belayer, but a competent one will work just as well. 
Next time, look for partners who don't end every climbing day with a list of excuses longer than their brand new, never fallen on, 70 meter maxim rope. If you can't get psyched to train, then climbing harder isn't that important to you. Assuming that's the case, you should close this book and go hang out in the gym lobby. They're far friendlier than I am and won't tell you that you're lying to yourself. I'm trying to get back in shape. Come on now. I've seen you in the gym every week for the last six years, and you've always been climbing at this level. Forever. Exactly what shape are you trying to get back into? Maybe this only happens at my gym, but I doubt it. There are always a few people who are perpetually getting back into shape before they really start training hard and pushing into the next level. I understand. you found your comfort zone, and it's hard to leave it. Do me a favor and try it a few times. Do it when the gym is empty so there are no judgmental eyes on you. I bet that you'll do something you didn't think you could, and you'll want to tell your friends about it. You might even want to spend a little more time on it to get better. Then again, maybe not. Comfort zones exist for lazy people. You should just stay there. My elbows, shoulders, fingers, skin hurt too bad. This isn't a new thing. You've been using the same excuse for six months now. Do something about it. Commit to the solution. Try everything you can to heal whatever problem it is you're having. If you had started when the pain did, you'd be fine now. You'd know how to remedy it next time, and you wouldn't have this excuse. Yes, I understand that the pain is real, but you're still at the crag or in the gym, so it isn't bad enough to stop you from climbing entirely. In fact, didn't I see you campusing problems in your flip-flops with no warm-up? Uh-huh. You get no sympathy. Do something to remedy the issue, or just shut up and push through. Is it obvious that I just can't tolerate slackers for long? Here's my point. If you don't commit to putting time in, you'll never get the chance to have to commit to that crux move at the top of the hardest route you've tried. You'll never have the satisfaction of knowing that you pushed through the nerves and the fear, went for it, and took the fall. You'll never do that rock over move high above the pads and top out your first high ball. And that's perfectly okay if you don't want those things. But if you do, I suggest you take a deep breath, commit, and don't squash the banana. So my name is Yasmeen Fowler, and I have been climbing for about 20 years now. Started in Cincinnati. Doesn't that sound crazy when you say it? It sounds absolutely crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. I've spent more of my life climbing than not climbing. Yeah. Oh, wow. I hadn't yeah, I passed that, that threshold way. recently. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, what else? Let's see. Just as far as being climbing related, um, mostly I climb at the red. Um, I've been in Knoxville for a while now. And so I get to go to the Obed more frequently, which is really nice. Um, and then as far as the, um, the Red River community, I was on the board of the Red River Gorge Climbers Coalition um, from about 2012 to 2017. Um, but other than that... As was, president. Yeah. Yep. My last year was president. So kind of worked my way through secretary, vice president, then president. Um, and yeah, I got to be there for some of the exciting um, just land acquisition successes that uh that the rgcc's had i love that you say i got to be there for because yeah. if i were introducing you i would say she masterminded the acquisition of no. that's what i would say <laughs> <You're sweet>. so <laughs> no it was a huge effort but thank you <laughs> yeah from from everyone i'm not gonna let your humbleness completely fly so wow and, and also a, you know, you've been climbing 513 for a lot of years. You're, you're a mm -hmm. very good climber. You, you have a women's group that you lead in Knoxville. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Once I moved here, um, the, the program had been going on. Um, it's <clears throat> ladies night at the climbing center, but, um, but I joined as one of the instructors. So, um, 
hopefully soon this, uh, okay, it's May right now, hopefully in a few months, we'll get to start the program back up. Um, <clears throat> it's been yeah. on hold because of COVID, but yeah, um, yeah, I've gotten to be one of the instructors for ladies night, which is, um, really fun. It's the first Monday of each month and just, um, kind of, a no judgment space for people who identify as female to come in and try out the sport or continue their relationship with the sport. We were, um, we were lucky, but before we had to shut it down for COVID, we had a nice group of repeat um, participants. So it's, it's nice to see people mm. start and then continue their relationship with the sport. Yeah, it's, it's very cool. You know, one of the, one of the things that I feel like I've grown into and, you know, you've seen, we've seen each other's growth over yeah. the last, you know, 20 years or so. Yeah. And one of the things I feel like I've grown into is wanting to give more back to the community. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there was definitely a period and I, and I'm glad I went through this period where climbing was a really selfish thing. Yeah. Um, and it still is to some degree, but it mm -hmm. also is this vehicle that I feel like I can use to help people find something that's therapeutic for them, Yeah, you know, that I can use to change people's minds about things um, yeah. or at least make them think deeper about things. So. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> no, I, I do think that, you know, eventually after developing our own skills, the tendency is to, to wonder how we can share them. You know, because, it, mm -hmm. I mean, you can't take any of them with you once you die. I know that sounds really morbid, <laughs> but. <you're, laughs> it's true. At least what, we think it's true. Yeah. Yeah. One of my good friends just, <laughs> I mean, after she, um, she helped me improve at knitting, she was like, well, this is how people stay alive, you know, by, by sharing their skills with others. Yeah. It's like, that's such a pretty sentiment, you know? And, and so, yeah, why not share the things you can do well? Mm, that's very cool. Yeah. So this chapter, the don't squash the banana commitment chapter, do you yeah. remember the ridiculous photos that we took in RockQuest when I first I wrote this Those article? Great. Yes. <laughs> and I do think we managed to keep from wasting any of the bananas. I think they all yeah, got I, eaten I afterwards, think, chalky yeah. hands and all. Yeah. Yeah, no bananas were harmed in the making of that article. No, they were all appreciated <laughs> after they posed for the photos with us. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> yeah, this this article, this essay is actually a special one for me because when we were we were putting the book together, uh, Brittany and I spent many days going back and forth about how the cover Ooh. should look. Okay. And we we're trying to put one of Brendan's charts on the cover yeah. because his charts are brilliant, mm -hmm. but that much like information that much make you think on the yeah. cover of the book just wasn't working. And yeah, that makes sense. And we just kept going back and forth and back and forth. And then actually lying in bed one night, I was like, oh, let me, let me try the banana. Yeah. And I, and I did it on my phone. Like I did a rough mock-up on my phone mm -hmm. and messaged it to Brittany. And she was like, that's it. That's, that's the one. That's the one. Oh, that's cool. <clears throat> so the the banana became the thing. And I actually drew yeah. it the next morning sitting. Nate was sitting across the table from me. And I yeah. opened my iPad and I drew the banana. And it took, you know, five minutes tops. And, yeah. And I showed it to Nate and he's like, oh, yeah, that that's it. That's funny. You know? Well, and and it's actually interesting. I hadn't really thought of it this way, but like but typically something broken signifies like failure, you know? Mm -hmm. But yeah. then you look at the banana all, you know, snapped in half and quote unquote broken, yeah. and it does kind of, you know, I mean it symbolizes how at least in climbing you got to fail a bunch before you succeed. Um, and yeah, it's just totally. it kind of it makes you curious about why is, why is there a broken banana on the cover? Why does that matter? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. It's just, it's such a cool symbol yeah. and it, it took off in a way that I never expected. Like all these people yeah. on Instagram snapping bananas and yep, yep. it was just really fun to watch the response to that. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah. And that, you know, that essay was also a really personal one for me because it, you know, took place, you know, the, the seeing Nate snap the banana for the first time was yeah. under ultra perm. And then yep. while I was climbing on ultra perm was when my grandpa died and I got right. the text message about it while I was sitting under ultra perm. And yep. so there's a lot of emotion and learning that happened on that route for me. You know, it was my first 13 yeah. D and just, just so much that happened sitting under that route. Yeah. Um, so it, it really makes me happy that the banana became the cover. Made it onto the cover. Know? Yeah. I think you are one of the best people I know at removing most, I'll say most of the excuses for yourself. Yep. And that's sort of what this chapter is about. Like commit to the thing fully, mm -hmm. try your best to situate your life such that it removes those excuses. Yeah. And that you can, you can be fully committed to it and not give yourself an out. And I think you're very, very good at that. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah. I try to take accountability when, when I, when I stray from the program, but um, because it is, it's all a choice. I mean, and it's a luxury that it is a choice. So mm -hmm. I don't want to, I don't want to make any of it seem like, you know, it's, it's being, forced on me or, or any of that. It's a, it's a luxury to have the, the time to dedicate to a passion. So any choices that, that flow from that are all, you know, they're, they're personal choices. Um, but one of, yeah, one of the things that, that I was thinking about, um, you know, when I, I reread the chapter and, and was just thinking about the whole, commitment thing is it relates specifically to say focus training is um, mm -hmm. instead of just taking it for granted that, Oh, you should, you should commit to this. Um, I mean, before even deciding that it's probably worth determining whether that's even going to make you happy. Like right, my, right, um, totally. <laughs> because that's going to, if you decide that it does, that's going to make the whole thing a lot easier. Mm -hmm. um, but my experience personally was, I climbed for a bunch of years without much focus on getting stronger. It was just, you know, Hey, it's kind of neat that I'm accidentally getting stronger and making gains, yeah. um, just as a result of experience. And that was enough for a lot of years. Um, and then, um, I spent about a year doing some focus training with you and got to see a bump in improvement. And that was great. Um, and then I just kind of took a year off from focus training um, mm -hmm. and just uh, because it, I think it was because the focus training was so new that I was like, oh, this is, you know, it takes a lot of time and, you know, it, it is a little bit of increased pressure that I'm putting on myself. So I, I just kind of like let it fade away a little for a year. Um, and then during that year, I kind of noticed that I was, I just missed it. Like I missed having climbing goals and working toward them and, um, and missed how, um, just how improving at climbing made my mind and body feel. I just, I like the way that yeah. the sport makes me feel, you know, <clears throat> um, I like how it makes me use my body. Um, and then after that, like after those two years of experimenting one way and then the other, it was pretty easy to commit to focus training. I was like, I've, I've tried both and I yeah. prefer how I feel with it. So so if someone's having trouble committing, maybe just run a little experiment. I mean, it doesn't have to be that same amount of time. Maybe you can learn it more quickly. But um, but just be honest with yourself about how you felt in both situations. If you just prefer freedom from commitment, then, then that's kind of the end of that story. That's okay. Um, if you prefer the commitment, mm -hmm. then then commit and then remind yourself of that. When, when your excuses start piling up, just remind yourself that you prefer this and you chose it, you know? Yeah, I think it's really interesting and I hadn't really thought about it this way that ultimately all the things I talk about in this chapter aren't just, you know, you have to commit to getting outside a certain number of days or getting into the gym or focus training or commit mm -hmm. to the move or whatever. It's all sort of wrapped up in a commitment to 
bettering yourself through your own happiness and enjoyment? Like, yeah. it, is this something I will be happy about that I will enjoy that I'll be proud of? Right. If, if yes, then can I commit to that? Yeah. You know, and yeah. then that trickles down into lots of other things, but, but ultimately yeah. that's what it's all about. Right. That's, that's the first decision. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> Yeah. First decision for you and indecision for me at this point, because I hadn't really yeah. thought of it like that. Yeah. It, yeah. Ultimately it is, you know, the, the case, I know that it makes me feel better. It makes me feel good. It makes me feel yeah. good about myself. Mm -hmm. Um, so not just physically, but I also feel better emotionally, yeah. mentally. I'm a, I can be a better partner. You mm -hmm. know, I can be a better romantic partner. I can, all the things yeah. I can be better if I feel better about myself. So a hundred percent. And this is one path toward that. Yeah. It's, it's really yeah. easy to let things pile up, especially in this world where we're constantly bombarded. You know, we, we could, we could be constantly busy if we want to. And I often end up going that direction. Yeah. And it's easy to let some things go and then start feeling bad about them, you know, yeah. things you didn't commit to. And, you know, maybe yeah. it's easier to just say, okay, what of these are going to make me happy? I'm going to commit to those, these other yeah. things, they can go away. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that <clears throat> way, if you had the luxury of making that choice, you get to remind yourself that it's a choice, you know, it's, it's not an obligation. I mean, I, I don't, owe anyone my climbing performance, you know, it's, it's something yeah. that I'm choosing to work on for me. So, and I know, I, I mean, obviously people who are climbing at an extremely high level and making their living from it, that's different. But I think for most of us, it, it gets to be a choice, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It, I think that's a really great reminder and I'm glad you went that direction in mm -hmm. thinking about this chapter. You yeah. know, it, it's it's very easy to get wrapped up in. I have to post something about climbing today yeah. on Instagram because I haven't in a few days. You know, I, I need people to see that I'm climbing. And yeah, yeah, it's it's such an interesting time in trying to parse out what's for you, what's for other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you see so much of other people. Yeah. You're, yeah. you're really good at, I'm not going to, I'm going to try not to go too much into detail here, but you're really good at um, thinking way ahead, planning for, for your enjoyment in the future, you know, which yeah. I think is different than the typical societal planning for your future. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Yeah. You're really good at that. And does that all revolve around what you just said about, you know, this is my, this is what's going to make me happy. So I'm planning for that. Or did st part of it start with this societal, you know, you have to put this much money aside or you have to plan for these things. Um, that's a good question. I think, <clears throat> I think I'm lucky enough that it's been a choice. Um, some of some of the some of the early choices, I suppose, like going to college and <clears throat> studying computer science, were even those were made. Um, I mean, they obviously they were choices as well, but. Um, but it was a mix of, I enjoy this, it makes me happy, I enjoy the challenge, and um, it's a path to financial independence. So I think, um, I mean, I wouldn't have, I, I think I've been lucky to be able to make choices that work toward my happiness well, mm -hmm. while staying happy the whole time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess it's just because it's continuous. It's a continuous series of choices. Um, and so, and I was also lucky to, um, to be surrounded by people that, that didn't put societal pressures on, mm. you know, it, like, like my parents from the beginning. I mean, I, I chose a slightly different path. They, they were both athletes, but they were never interested in climbing. Um, 
but they were super supportive. Well, it's huge to have parents and friends, people surrounding you who can provide you with the the space um, to take those opportunities. Yes, right. And I keep saying lucky, but it's privilege. I mean, privilege is the right word for it because it wasn't luck that gave me the opportunity to to make those choices. Yeah, I think it's a common thing that people look on the surface and think that what they what they have is luck Mm -hmm. when actually if you look deeper if you look at the roots of it it's a it's really a privilege you've been given that was given to someone before you and passed on um you know for any number of reasons right i mean my parents they they grew up in different countries but but each of them experienced privilege you know in in those countries and so i I got that started. I started from a place of privilege. Totally. I see a lot of your mom in you. You know, your mom is one of my favorite humans and, you know, just such an inspiring woman. And I see a lot of that in you. And it occurs to me that your mom is very much rooted in uh, a, a, a search, maybe not even a search, but but in, in happiness, you know, yes. and in, and in helping other people and because sharing, it makes her yeah. happy, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I see a lot of that in you and, and I think that's rubbed off on me a bit. So I appreciate that cool. from both you and your mom. Oh, hundred percent. Thank you. And she'll probably listen to this. So, so she'll <laughs> Well, I love her dearly um, and I, and I appreciate her so much and, and you as well, you know, you're, Thank you. you know, like people here in the next episode, you're one of my oldest and best friends and likewise and most trusted people. You know, I don't, I don't easily put my trust in people. Um, I don't commit to people easily and, yeah, yep. and you're one of the people I commit to pretty damned easily so well thank you yeah definitely i feel the same way about you thank you yeah all right i'm gonna move on to my next of so many appointments today to talk about this book which yeah which feels a little (laughs) like work and a little like (laughs) a celebration of this thing that i that i did so yeah no congratulations it's been awesome to watch it all grow Thanks, Yaz. I will talk to you again soon. Okay. Talk to you soon. All right. Bye. Bye. Tomorrow, even good beta spray is bad beta spray. We don't tweet. We scream like eagles. This time, 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 this time to build power. This time, 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 It's time to build.